just the day before Independence Day, and so I I've allowed my myself some time. I want you to know that as a pastor, there are two things that are uppermost in my mind. Number one, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter three. Isn't that right, Cindy? Second Peter went up, Cindy, and some of the rest of you and Andy. We've been memorizing that. God is not willing to finish it first, but that all should come to repentance. That is the will of God. As a church, as a pastor, I would like to be able to say that everyone who attends this church is a true believer. Born again. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in And so I... I, I'm sure that every Sunday I don't uh, make it clear how to become a Christian. And you can't always do that, I understand that. But I want you to know that if you, if you don't know for sure if you're a Christian or don't know how to become a Christian, talk to me about it. I think I can make it simple. I think sometimes churches make it difficult for people to really know. I grew up thinking that if there really is a God and one day I would stand before him, he would ask me, how good have you lived? That's not the most important question. It is, am I trusting fully without reservation? on the fact that Jesus died for me. Have I put my trust in Do I trust him completely? And the devil toys with that question in our mind because he wants us to have some doubt about the relationship to God. So as a pastor, I'm concerned about the second thing I'm concerned about. The Bible teaches that every Christian needs to live a spirit-filled life. Spirit-filled. Let's give it a, a different meaning. The same meaning, but in different words. We need to have a spirit-controlled life. Doesn't mean speaking in tongues. I want to be clear in my ministry. I have some questions in my mind about, uh, about the charismatic movement. And I remember going to charismatic church in the Pastor gave an invitation at the end of the service for people to come in uh, to be slain in the spirit. And so he touched them. They fell over backwards. I've told you that before. Maybe this is the second time I've talked about that in third. And so about 10, 12 people, they all fell over backwards. I disagree with that. I don't think that being slain in the spirit, what does that mean? Now I know that God struck down, or Paul was so struck on the road to Damascus that he fell to the ground. But God was getting his attention that he was not a true believer. And so he fell to the ground and he was blind, what? For three days? Because they took him to the city, and after three days, then he became a Bible Christian. He became filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It means that each day the Spirit of God who indwells the believer, he comes into your life when you put your trust in him. You may not feel it, but there will be some evidence that the Holy Spirit lives in your life. You might shout, you might, you might do things that you normally wouldn't do, and I'm not going to put, put those things on you. You may not do anything, but you know that the Spirit of God is in, 
because you begin to live different. Hey, a Christian, a true Christian lives different than the average guy on the street. So the purpose of the pastor is to try to teach to the people who are his flock under him. What does it mean to live a spirit-filled life? It means that every day the Holy Spirit is controlling your life, your actions, your mouth, your words, the way you live, and uh, and He'll try to direct you when you're not living right. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So He wants us to be saved, and He wants us to live a spiritual, spiritual life. You read, you heard on TV. Most of you watch the news, national TV. The guy that was in prison for 20 years for murder was released because some people in the south part of our country, I don't know where it was, Georgia, Alabama, some, some place in the south, they testified and let it be known that when a murder was committed in Brooklyn, New York, that he was not in Brooklyn. 10 or 12 or 14 witnesses said, no, he wasn't there. He was somewhere in the south. He couldn't have committed the murder. They had to release him. Because he didn't do it. He didn't do it. That's one thing that happened in the news. And I'm going to maybe say a little bit about that a little bit later on. The second thing that happened is that we heard this, what, on Friday? England voted out of the European Union. They voted to leave. Pretty close vote, like 52 to 48. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't get away from saying something about that. That really shook up the whole world. And I understand that some cities, some countries like Norway and Sweden and Denmark and some of those other, maybe others, are thinking about doing the same thing. 28 countries make up the European Union. If you know the Word of God, if you study prophecy at all, you know, and you've heard me say, I believe that we live at the end of this age that we live. It's about 2,000 years. The end of the age of grace began on the day of Pentecost when Jesus had ascended to heaven and he said, the Holy Spirit cannot come unless I ascend to heaven and I will send him, go to Jerusalem and wait for the giving of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1 and 2, the Holy Spirit was given to indwell all people who became Christian. So from that day until the end of the age, call it the age of the Holy Spirit or the age of grace, we live in that age. I believe that we live at, we live at the end of that age. At the end of this age, ten nations of Europe, headed by the Antichrist, will try to take over the world and will give the mark of the beast to people who submit to the Antichrist and those who do not submit to the Antichrist and will not receive the mark of the beast Many of those will be killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. I just say that to say this. 28 nations in the European Union, at some point in time, that will be reduced to 10 nations led by the Antichrist. I call it the revived Roman Empire. One can make a statement about that because I watch things like that now for the rest of the time, I want to go in a different direction. We are prisoners of time. God created time. And I like to think of that time is put in this little space between eternity past and eternity future. We have time. We live in the age of time. Time is our friend and our opportunity. 
Second Corinthians chapter, excuse me, Second Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So from the time that we become a believer until the time that we die and have our mind, we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Time is our opportunity. We should not let time slip by without growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Time is of the essence. Time means everything to us. Every day, we have the passing of time. So during this time of growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, I want to talk about the freedom that God wants us to have as believers. When I get up in the morning, I should, I should be anxious to know and to experience the freedom that God gives to me as a believer, as a Christian. He wants me to be free from the bondage of sin. The bondage of sin. Egypt in Scripture is a picture of the bondage of sin. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. We know that the children of Israel spent 430 years in Egypt. And they were under bondage the whole time that they were there. And so it says in these verses, So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. Then verse 14, And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. What do you think Satan does in people's lives? He wants you and me to be bound by sin. As the people of Israel were bound in their service to the Egyptians and the Pharaoh. And at the end of, the, uh, of that period of time, God saw the distress and the bondage that were, they were in. And he called Moses to lead them out. But the bondage of Egypt. God wants to be free from the bondage of sin. Just to mention, why is my grandson in jail? He's in bondage to the slavery of sin in his life. And I say that kind of I love my grandson. But he sits in jail because he's in bondage. God wants to free you from the bondage of sin. Last Sunday I mentioned about my dad. He wasn't a Christian until about 28. And I don't know that he was what you call in bondage uh, to drinking and smoking. But when he became a Christian, God delivered him from the bondage of those two addictive things. My dad said to the Lord, I want those things to go from my life. I learned long ago to try to quit picking on people who do those things. No, I mean, when we talk about sin, those are just two, two of the many things that bind us in our lives, that keep us from being all that God wants us to be. You can be bound with so many things, and we want to look at a few of them. There are three things, three steps in being free from bondage. In John chapter 8, verse 31, please notice what it said. Then Jesus said to those who Jews who believed in him. He was talking about people who are now uh, moving away from Judaism, putting their faith and trust in Christ. And 
So he was talking to those who believed in him. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. What is the word of God? I have it right here in my hand. If I abide in his word, that's one of the first steps in being free from the bondage of sin. Abiding in his word. Being in it. Reading it. Studying it. Memorizing it. Abiding in his word. And in verse 34 of John 8, it describes that bondage. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. You're not. There are some who commit sin repeatedly. They do it. Day after day, week after week, year after year, until they die. They, com they commit sin on a regular and daily, monthly, yearly basis. So Jesus says, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. You're in bondage to sin. It's pictured in the commission of sin. So there are three steps being free from bondage. I talked about one, continuing in the Word. Number two, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I had one of my family members just came and said, Roscoe, I'd like to have you sign a note with me. He was in debt. And I said to him, calling by the name, I said, I said, I'm sorry. You're my friend, you're my relative, I love you. And we're the best of buddies. But I can't sign you know. He said, what? I said, I read the book of Proverbs this morning. Not to do that. He was astounded. He was astounded. I freed myself from a debt that God didn't want me to have. So I didn't sign him. I don't know if he was ever able to pay it off or not. I hope he was. God didn't want me to do that. The Bible is very clear on that. It says don't sign for your neighbor's debts. The truth makes us free. It helps us to understand the Word of God in our life. Knowing the truth frees me from the bondage of sin. And then again, it makes me free. It is Jesus who frees us from sin. John 8, verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I want to finish my message this morning when the time is up, but I'm going to take another four or five minutes. Let's look at some of the bondages that people have. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators. Let's talk a minute about it. Our country is filled with fornicators. That means sex outside of marriage. Sex outside of marriage. I would say that the majority of people who get married today are living without the benefit of marriage. That's sinful. The bondage of sin, fornicators. Notice the next word. Idolaters. That's people who put God above every, every put things above God in their life. I know that's the bondage of sin. Homosexuals. Don't be deceived. Idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Our country is filled today with the culture that those things just get along with people. Maybe you don't do it, but let them live their own life. Let them do it. Why do you think that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? That's why we have the word Sodomite. Because it is a sin against nature and against God. By the way, I have friends 
who are homosexual and lesbian. They're my friends. But they know that I do not agree with their sin. I do not agree with their sin. I think I said one time, if we were to be a receiving church, the only way I would receive homosexuals and lesbians and transvestites and what other name you can give to them, let them come and sit in the pews and listen to the Word of God. And I'm here to say, if, if God is who He is, if God is who He says He is, if God can speak the Word, and create the universe and create Adam and Eve and take Eve out of Adam's sight. If God can really do that, and we believe that, don't we? We believe that God spoke the Word and the world came into being. The universe came into being. We believe that. Can we also believe that God can change the heart of a sinner and give him a new heart? and new desire, and new victory, and lay aside the sin in his life. Can we believe that? Do we believe that? I believe that if I'm a liar, a girl that used to come to her home all the time, she said, I'm a liar. Do you think that God could change her mind, and change her things in her head, so that she would learn and have the strength and the power. Why does God give us the Holy Spirit? He gives us the Holy Spirit of power to help us change our lives. Why? Notice the next thing. Thieves. Next verse. That's all right. Not the next verse, but let me, let me tell you what it says. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, like the Ponzi scheme. All of these things characterize the life of many people. And God says they will not inherit eternal life. And I want to close with this. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you. If I were, if you were to give your testimony today, some of you would say the same thing. Such were some of you. Some of you used to be that way. Do you know that all of us are ex-sinners? All of us. Not a single person here today is not an ex-sinner. I remember a little boy, was about eight years old, out in the pasture with another young guy. The little young guy, about my same age, wanted he and I to do a homosexual act. I was not a Christian, I was not a believer, I had not given my life to Jesus Christ. But I knew that inherently, I knew that was wrong. I knew it was sinful. I knew it, and I wouldn't do it. This verse says, Paul mentions all those terrible things in that verse. All those terrible things, and then he says, as he writes this letter to the young Christians in Corinth, he says, such for some of you, you used to be that way, but you're not that way anymore. But now how are you? You are washed. You are made clean. God forgives it. He makes you all clean. You're washed. Then he says you're sanctified. That means in God's sight you're holy. You're holy before God. And then he says, and you were justified. That simply means you're just like that you never sinned. Not one single time in your life. God looks at you and me when we know Jesus. We are justified in the name of Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of God. Well, God bless His Word to our hearts today.
Now God help us to live the kind of life that He wants us to live. We're going to sing.